And meanwhile, we take the liberty most distinctly and emphatically to assure you, and we appeal to their own public declarations and dying testimonies for the truth of what we say, that had these confessors not magnanimously chosen the ground which the Reformed Presbyterian Church has been endeavoring for a century and a half to maintain, and by which she is distinguished from all others, their heads would never have rolled on gory scaffolds, nor would the gray memorials of their martyrdom have imparted so somber and hallowed an aspect to the sequestered dells and heath-clad hills of our fatherland. To us, therefore, belong alike the odium and the honor of identity with them. We have long borne the one, and we may surely now be permitted, without the charge of arrogance or presumption, to claim a share in the other. Quote, seeing that many glory after the flesh, we will glory also, unquote. All that has now been said has an intimate and important bearing on the point in hand, for it is necessary to a right understanding of the revolution settlement of the Church of Scotland that we clearly and correctly see the exact state to which the Presbyterian Church of the Second Reformation was then reduced. The gallant vessel, which had spread her canvas to the propitious gales of heaven, and had been manned by skillful and brave-hearted mariners, was overtaken by the rude and boisterous hurricane, and rendered a total wreck. While such as continued to cling to her shattered fragments were tossed hither and thither on a dark and stormy sea. Such was the state of matters in Scotland when the Prince of Orange landed on our shores and ascended the British throne. It shall then be our object in the next place to inquire how far the Presbyterian Church was restored to the position which she occupied before the restoration of Charles, and how far the principles of the Second Reformation were revived and exemplified. First, the first thing which merits our attention here is the measures adopted for the establishment of presbytery at the period in question. The proper province of the state in establishing the church is simply to receive from her the constitution which she has framed and enacted by her own intrinsic and independent authority, and at her special request, and after mature and serious consideration, to append it to the civil sanction, a sanction which bestows no ecclesiastical authority, but merely gives effect to it in so far, excuse me, but merely gives effect to it so far as civil consequences are concerned. These separate and independent functions were exercised by the church and the state, respectively, in the period of the First Reformation. The church held her first general assembly in 1560 by virtue of her own proper authority under Christ her head, arranged and fixed her constitution and her standards, and presented them to the civil power by which they were so far ratified. The same principle of ecclesiastical independence was specially guarded at the era of the Second Reformation, for though the concurrence of the state was earnestly sought, the church did not at all feel herself shackled from its refusal, as the proceedings of the famous assembly held in Glasgow in 1638 will abundantly testify. She abolished episcopacy as contrary to the word of God, and as the wicked hierarchy of the Roman Antichrist, settled her own constitution and subordinate standards, and then applied for and obtained the sanction of the state giving civil effect to the measures which she had independently adopted. But this simple and beautiful order was exactly inverted in the revolution settlement of the church. She, uh, she did not, at that period, present her constitution to the civil power, but the civil power enacted it independently of her authority. The church, indeed, was not in a capacity to be consulted when the measures affecting her government were gone into by the state, for she was in a condition of complete disorder and disorganization, without a constitution and without courts. The settlement was purely civil and secular. As a party bearing an ecclesiastical character was consulted in the matter, the celebrated claim of rights presented by the estates of Scotland to William on his ascension to the throne was the only basis of the arrangements made in regard to the government of the church. In that deed, the abolition of prelacy was craved because of great and unsupportable grievance and trouble to the nation and contrary to the inclinations of the generality of the people not because it was contrary to the word of God or inconsistent with the consisting of the church, uh, excuse me, or inconsistent with the constitution of the church, and the nation was settled in the reforming period, and upon that ground only was prelacy abolished and Presbyterian church government ratified. In the year 1640, prelacy was repudiated by the state upon the ground of the constitution and acts of the church in which it had been abolished as contrary to the word of God. See Act of Assembly at Glasgow, Session 16, December 8, 1638, and also... Act of Assembly at Edinburgh, at August, uh, excuse me, Session 8, August 17, 1639, and see Act 4, Parliament, 1640. 
But at the Revolution, neither prelacy nor presbytery was measured by such standards at all. While the state assumed the power of abolishing, in the Act 1689, not merely the establishment of prelacy, but all, quote, superiority of any office in the church of this kingdom above presbyters, unquote, it was surely the province of the church herself to declare what should be abolished in her and what retained. It will not do to tell us that in the Act 1690, settling Presbyterian government, is, it is said, the king and queen's majesties and the three estates of parliament, conceiving it to be their bound duty to settle and secure the true Protestant religion, according to the word of God, as also the government of, the, of Christ's church within this nation agreeable to the word of God. For besides these expressions being sufficiently vague, their verity is also remarkable. Excuse me, their variety is also remarkable. The Protestant religion is settled and secured according to the truth of God's word. But the government of the church is spoken of as something distinct from the true Protestant religion and is ratified as agreeable to the word of God. Now, it is well known that such is the language invariably employed by Erastians in regard to the government of the church. The Erastian party in the Westminster Assembly were ready to admit that Presbytery was agreeable to the word of God. And here a footnote. The proceedings of the Westminster Assembly clearly show that the reformers considered the expression agreeable to the word of God as falling far short of an acknowledgment of the divine right of Presbyterian church government. The proposition that scripture holds forth that many particular congregations may and by divine institution ought to be under one Presbyterian government was debated by them for 30 days. The Erastians did not object to presbytery as a political institution proper to be established by the civil magistrate, but they stoutly opposed the claim of a divine right. The Presbyterians, however, carried the question by a great majority. When the subject came on for debate in the House of Commons, the Erastians' independence prevailed in the division. It having been determined by them that the proposition of the assembly should stand thus, that it is lawful and agreeable to the word of God that the church be governed by congregational, classical, and synodical assemblies. This numerical triumph of their opponents in Parliament proved a grievous disappointment for, to the Scottish commissioners and their friends in the assembly. They alarmed the citizens of London with the cry that the church was in danger, and they prevailed with the common council to position Parliament uh, to to petition Parliament, excuse me, that the Presbyterian discipline might be established as the discipline of Jesus Christ, while the city ministers were also induced to present uh, to present a similar prayer. See Stevenson's History Book 3, Chapter 7. All this proves that the phraseology agreeable to the Word of God was deemed most, un most unsatisfactory by the genuine Presbyterians of the Second Reformation, a fact which must have been well known in 1690 when the Act of Settlement was framed and adopted. A recent movement in the United Sessions Synod is also very instructive on this point. At its meeting held in Edinburgh, June 1840, the third question in the formula of ordination which ran thus, quote, and the Presbyterian form of church government, etc., etc., the only form of church government which you acknowledge as founded upon and agreeable to the Word of God, unquote was altered so as to read as follows, quote, Do you believe the Presbyterian form of government to be agreeable to and founded upon the word of God? Unquote. This measure carried by a narrow majority was supported on the ground that the question as it formerly stood created unnecessary difficulties in the minds of good men who approved of Presbyterianism and regarded it as scriptural but were not disposed or prepared to pass a judgment on other forms of government. The obnoxious word only has thus been expunged, and voluntary, uh, and voluntary seceders have shaken hands with Erastian churchmen. See United Session Magazine for July of 1840, pages 418 and 419. While they maintain that it had no higher claims in this respect than other forms, Erastians of the present day hold exactly the same language. According to them, whatever form of government is, in the language of the act or settlement, agreeable to the inclinations of the generality of the people, or is taken by the state under its fostering care, is also, quote, agreeable to the word of God, unquote. And what other constitution can be given to this clause in the statute of 1690, especially since it appears, while presbytery was considered agreeable to the word of God, in Scotland, prelacy was deemed equally, if not more so, in England and Ireland. Neither the word of God nor the voice of the church were duly heard and consulted in the revolution settlement. 
Does any person ask, did the state not repeal the obnoxious acts of Charles, which rescinded all laws and acted in favor of the Presbyterian Church during the Second Reformation, as well as the Parliament which passed them? We answer, no. King William and his Parliament left the chasm as they found it. They found all recognition of the Presbyterian Church during that period obliterated from the statute book, save in the dark and dismal pages which recorded the unrighteous deed, and instead of making any attempt or manifesting any inclination to... Mit, uh, to undo those guilty acts, they retained them in all their validity and force and revived the Act of 1592 passed in the period of the First Reformation and, with the exception of the clause relating to patronages, which was reserved for future consideration, constituted it the charter of the established Church of Scotland. The General Assembly of 1690, held after the government of the Church had been thus settled, offered no objection to the course pursued even though the king, as if to prevent the possibility of misapprehension in, this, in the matter, distinctly informed them in his letter that he had concurred with, it, with his parliament in enacting such a frame of church government as was judged to be most agreeable to the inclinations of his subjects. Act of Assembly, Session 2, October 17, 1690, containing the king's letter. See also the Assembly's Answer, Session 4, October 18, 1690 and so manifested their acquiescence in the cool, deliberate, and studied insult paid to the Church of the Second Reformation.